Good evening and welcome. I'm Allison Ruppel Brown, President and CEO of the Science Museum of Minnesota. My pronouns are she and her. And I'm so excited to have you all here for this evening's event. Museums are an essential part of communities, and our museum has been part of this, these communities for 116 years. And um, thank you. And on behalf of the trustees and staff, we want to thank everyone for joining us tonight and for your support of our museum, our values, and these uncertain times is so crucial. Thank you again. The Museum Science is All of Us campaign features many programs, tools, and ex exhibitions like the Bias Inside Us. It capitalizes on the museum's position as a trusted resource, gathering place to engage visitors in critical topics of race and bias. We are delighted to have been the initial location for the first stop in 2021, and we are thrilled to have it back at our location to engage this year. Tonight is an opportunity to learn, engage, reflect with, on your own journey and in dialogue with others. And I'd like to welcome Marion Springle, the director of the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Services, and now to tell us more about the origins and implementation of this critical project, I'd like to introduce Miriam. She's the director of the Smithsonian Institution Traveling Exhibition Services and Smithsonian Affiliations. Welcome, Miriam. Thank you, Allison. Thank you for hosting us this evening, and thank you so much for saying the bias inside us should come back to the Science Museum. We're thrilled to be here. Um, we began the national tour of this important project here um, at the height of the pandemic. And of course, with closures and limited hours and impact on public health, um, we're just delighted that you invited us to come back. This is where it's, we're thrilled to be here. Um, this evening, I am particularly happy to be able to represent my Smithsonian colleagues who have worked on this project and to share with you a little bit of background on the bias inside us. The project explores the social science and psychology of implicit bias and provides an opportunity to learn how bias impacts the world around us. The project gives us all time to pause, and to consider our own biases and helps us change our mindset and the way in which the biases influence us and impact our behaviors and worldview. It's an important project. The Smithsonian became involved in this project in 2015. However, by that time, it already had deep roots in the Twin City through the work supported by the Jewish Community Relations Council of the Dakota, of Minnesota and the Dakotas. They nurtured this project, they nurtured the idea, gathered local support, and brought it to the Smithsonian. We, in turn, received generous support from the Twin Cities to take this community engagement project to the nation. We're delighted for that. The Otto Bremer Trust joined us as the national sponsor, and I want to particularly thank them this evening. To date, the bias inside us has visited 12 cities in the Midwest and the Southeast. And the feedback from the host communities has been everything we hoped for. As you heard from Laura a little earlier this evening, evaluation tells us how strong this project conceived of in the Twin Cities really is. People who tour the exhibition and take part in the programming hosted by the local venues are coming away with a much better understanding of how the brain works gaining insights into how bias begins, how it grows, and how we as individuals can check it, as we say in the exhibition. This is a tribute to the hard work of the project team, led by Laura Zell and Odia Wood Kruger, and the people who work 
on the exhibition and on the project at every one of the local venues. The content of the Bias Inside Us was developed in collaboration with a large group of advisors and experts in the field. I won't list them all. You heard about many of them earlier this evening. Um, but there are a few who are particularly relevant here tonight as we do this presentation. The first important person that I want to thank is Joanne Jones Rizzi, the Vice President of Science, Equity, and Education here at the Science Museum, and her colleagues who were responsible for developing the um, project Race, Are We So Different? They were critical in sharing their experience in presenting the important but complicated stories that are told through this project. Um, we are very deeply grateful for the way in which they informed um, the ways in which we tackled the topic of implicit bias. The second um, to acknowledge here this evening is the brilliant Dr. Corey Yeager, who was a key navigator for the project. He helped to guide the project team to consider bias as the lens to discuss our shared humanity always with an eye towards unpacking injustice. His teachings are at the heart and soul of this project. We are thrilled that you have joined us tonight for a keynote speaker with Corey. Dr. Corey Yeager is a licensed marriage and family therapist. His therapeutic practice focuses primarily on serving the African American community. As a school-based mental health provider, he worked tirelessly as a therapist in the Hennepin County Juvenile Detention Center through the um, Minnesota Public Schools. In his previous role as the Director of Educational Equity for the Office of Black Male Student Achievement within the Minneapolis School um, District, Corey was unwavering in his assault on the perceived achievement gap of African American males. Corey's passion for athletics and mental health have merged in his current role as psychotherapist for the Detroit Pistons, where he supports the players, the coaching staff, and the front of house leadership. Additionally, he works diligently to facilitate the advancement of meaningful dialogue surrounding the subject of race and racism. And if that's not enough, he's an author. Through his book, How Am I Doing?, Corey guides readers through <laughs> through his great book. See, this gives me a chance to plug your book. How am I doing? Um, Corey studies readers, um, encourages readers through a series of self-reflective questions to discover their purpose and explore who they want to be. It is with great pleasure that I introduce Dr. Corey Yeager. Thank you, Miriam. I appreciate that. Um, so as I start off today, I, will have, to, I have to say, um, Miriam uh, touched on the fact that I work with the Detroit Pistons um, in the NBA. And we had a game in Dallas um, just a few days ago. And we were supposed to be there for 24 hours. I ended up getting on a flight out of Dallas this morning at 11 o'clock to make it for today. Um, so. That it's been a circuitous route uh, and journey to get here um, just for this conversation tonight. Um, but I'm deeply, deeply grateful for the opportunity um, to join you all today in discussing a topic that I think we all should be deeply engaged in, um, and that is um, implicit bias. So as I talk about bias tonight, you'll hear me use the, the terms uh, interchangeably. Uh, implicit and unconscious bias. I use them back and forth. Uh, so just want to frame that that briefly. So let me just give you a, a bit about who I am. Um, my mom, Bev, sits in the front seat here, so I know she's giggling and smiling to see to see her baby boy um, doing this, uh, and I'm I'm happy for that. Yes. So I grew up in a small rural farming community in Kansas, right on the border of, of Kansas and Oklahoma. My grandparents um, were part of the great migration from the south 
Um, I don't really see that framed as a migration. I think that was more of a refugee movement. Um, but they moved to Kansas and literally three miles across the border uh, from Oklahoma settled in a little small community called Arkansas City, Kansas. I grew up there. Um, my mom literally just moved up to Minnesota in the last few months and had been in that same home in Kansas that I grew up in. Um, so thinking about bias, there are roots in my upbringing um, that have really played out across my lifespan. Um, so it's an opportunity to talk about things that have deeply impacted me across my journey. Um, so what is bias? Uh, what is implicit bias? And the best way I can describe it is uh, something that's occurring at a level below consciousness. This conversation that we're having today is conscious. We're conscious of this convo. But the power of the subconscious is much deeper and more profound than I think that we really understand. And implicit bias finds its home in that subconscious level. Um, it's about the assumptions and prejudgments that we have, especially about gr other groups, groups other than the ones that we belong, to, belong in or belong to. Um, that's where implicit bias is. Um, the types of bias occurring at that level below consciousness can be seen in gender issues, racial issues, sexual orientation. Um, one thing that I talk about when I'm engaging with groups, especially in the educational realm, is that we must do a better job of being very clear about what type of bias that we're talking about. Far too often we talk about and use the buzzword diversity. Well, what is diversity? It just means difference. Everyone, this whole crowd is diverse. Um, so when we talk about bias, let's be specific about exactly what it is that we're touching on. If we're going to talk about racialized bias, let's be clear on that. And that does not diminish the fact that there's gender bias. But for certain conversations, let's be clear about that. And I think that's something that we have to play with. Bias is a very tricky thing. Right? If, we, if it's happening at a, at a level below consciousness, you're not going to be aware of it. It's occurring. You're not going to really be able to see it or feel it or understand it as bias as it unfolds, but it is there. Um, one of the things, Dr. Sharon Danis is in the crowd. I got a chance to see her. She was one of my professors at the University of Minnesota, um, and I got my PhD in family social science. Well, what we are finding um, over the last number of years is the convergence of social science and neuroscience. They're beginning to find a connection. Um, and the research is showing that we can prove a number of things that we didn't previously understand. Um, and implicit bias is one of those spaces. Um, oftentimes, bias can be conflated into seeing it as things like racism. So especially for my white peers, when they hear things like bias, they'll shy away from it. Because oftentimes, the stance will be, I don't want to be seen as or being discussed as racist. So they'll lean away from it. So I hope that we can find the way, and I think that the bias inside us is doing a great job of being very specific about understanding what it is that this bias is, and, and not allowing it be, to be conflated into thinking that it's about racism. Um, and I think that's a particularly important space to occupy. Um, so we'll talk about that more as we go. Um, but the bottom line is, is that we all suffer from implicit bias. Every individual, every human being suffers from implicit bias, for instance, um, worked in the Minneapolis public school system. Um, our, our offices are right off of Broadway in North Minneapolis. So as I would go to work every day, I would see kids that were part of that community in Minneapolis, North Minneapolis, predominantly African American. So one thing, I'm doing work, have a PhD, engaged in understanding race and racism at a deep level. But I know that if you take me to North Minneapolis at 2 in the morning and I see a group of black or brown boys 
walking down the street. They could easily be my nephews, but there would be something in my mind that said, all right, what are they up to? I have to watch that. But those could be my nephews. So this is implicit bias working, working all the time at a level that we're not necessarily clear on or understand. So I think when we, think, when we talk about the bias inside us, I have to go back. So where's Laura? Laura's in here somewhere. There she is. So <laughs> that, we're here because of Laura Zell. This is the reason that we're here. Um, so a number of years ago, as I was, I was trying to survive what I would call as a rite of passage, a PhD at the University of Minnesota, um, Laura called me. Uh, and I am in the throes of the PhD, and it is zapping every ounce of my spirit. Um, and Laura calls and says, I need to talk to you. Right? So Laura, um, I, I am, her husband is cousins with my wife. So it's been a family connection um, across all these years. So she calls, said, I want to talk to you about something that I'm interested in, in pursuing. So we found some time. She came by the house. Um, and the idea was already formulating. So we were in discussion. She's taking notes. I'm, because I'm playing into this space of socialization for African American males. I was d diving into the research, and this, this concept of implicit bias kept showing up in the research. Um, so Laura and I began to talk at my house. So th that first meeting was, I'm sure, three hours. And I think Laura said 30 minutes of my time. Four hours later, <laughs> four hours and five, yeah, five years later, here we stand. <clears throat> um, but one of the things that Laura touched on early in that conversation was this idea of tolerance um, and trying to figure out where, where she was going to go with it. And one thing that I talked to Laura about that I thought was really important, I have to be clear that tolerance is the lowest level of acceptance that we can have. I can literally hate you and tolerate you. Um, so even the language that we choose becomes critically important. So implicit bias uh, kind of formulated itself in those conversations. Um, I will not own anything other than the support of what Laura was up to, because um, her mind was moving in a beautiful way. And I just happened to be diving into research that was connected to the work that she was endeavoring upon. Um, so it's been a beautiful opportunity um, to be of support over this, over this journey. Um, and I want to connect a dot or two. We're going to spend some time here uh, and do a little different thing. Don Shelby, who um, we all know and love and miss every day seeing him on the evening news. Um, Don and I are going to spend some time in conversation in the best way I can describe it, in a fishbowl idea that we're going to sit here and, and have some conversations and thoughts um, and hopefully we'll in, engage and interact with you all. Um, but before I get there, the last thing I want to touch on is a study. Uh, well, I'm a research nerd, if you couldn't tell. Um, I'm a research nerd. Sharon Dane has had a hell of a lot to do with that. So. Um, one of the studies that I found and started to play with was a Harvard study in the last few years. And the Harvard study um, was about family uh, engagement, relationships, and it was a, the longest longitudinal study um, in, in America, 85 years. So going all the way back, I think, into the 30s, they began to follow people. Um, and one thing that they found in this study was that people that had warm, long-term, and a plethora of meaningful relationships were living longer than, than others in the group. So we can come to understand that relationships, warm relationships, could, could factor into your level of happiness. That's, we can see that, we can understand that. But why would it impact you in living longer? Well, what the research began to tell them <clears throat> is that the people with these long-term warm relationships um, were avoidant of stress in a different way. So almost those meaningful relationships were stress relievers. So the flip of that 
or people that were dealing with long-term stress because they were isolated and more lonely. So if you're isolated and more lonely, that what they're finding, what the data was kind of speaking to them about was that you may be exhibiting a low level of stress hormone more often. So that isolation, that loneliness may be producing what we could call cortisol in the system. You're having uh, low level cortisol dumps almost at a persistent basis. So that would shorten your lifespan. So why do I talk about this? Why would I think that that study would have anything to do with bias? Well, connecting the dots, one thing that I deeply believe is that implicit bias, especially in the realm of race, but across the board, would, allow, would not allow you to seed relationships that could be very deeply meaningful. And if those relationships are seeded and held on to, they also could be a stress reliever. So we need exemplars. Well, some of the research on implicit bias is talking about the importance of exemplars. So at a young age, if you're in fourth grade and you have an African-American male teacher, that exemplar may help you avoid a level of, of implicit bias. Um, so all of that, I think, is extremely important. Um, the bias inside us is doing rich and meaningful work um, in this exhibit. And I think, really, it's at the beginning of what it will ultimately do. It's going to continue to unfold. Uh, we will all continue to learn from it. Um, and as that learning continues to unfold, we'll learn more and add to it um, in a way that will benefit all of us as a community. So without further ado, I want to take some time. I want to invite Don up, and we're going to have a conversation. Who knows where this will go? If Don Shelby's running it, there's, we're, we're going to find out. Um, but I, I will I'll say again, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Uh, for the opportunity to, to join you this evening. Um, and I hope this is the first of a number of opportunities that we'll all have as we move forward. Thank you. Here we go, boss. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, let's start, Dr. Yeager, with the, uh, something you touched on. Mm -hmm. uh, about the uh, brain research mm -hmm. currently being done as it res uh, has to do with implicit bias. So I want to just ask you, uh, has anyone been able to figure out whether we're talking about nature or nurture? Mm -hmm. Are neural receptors in our brain programming us from childhood mm -hmm. uh, without the influence of environment uh, toward biases that are negative as opposed to the biases that uh, were biased against a saber-toothed tiger, as an example. <laughs> but uh, the implicit negative bias as it relates to, let's say, racism. Mm -hmm. Nature or nurture? Yeah, I think you asked a philosophical question that is at the cornerstone of every question that any existentialist would ever be asking. Um, and I don't know that there's necessarily a specific answer because you could argue both sides. So I would present to you or submit that it is a both and. That it is both nature and nurture that influence and impact bias. Um, the society in which we live that we're brought up in tells us a number of stories implicitly about who we are, who we should be, and what those other groups represent. And oftentimes those assumptions are not necessarily rooted in truth or fact, um, but we hand that off in society all day, every day. Um, so I think, to your point, Don, I think it's both. Um, I think that what we have to focus on deeply in our own specific social networks is the understanding of nurturing young people. How are we nurturing young people? What messages are we sending? What messages are they receiving around things like race? Um, oftentimes, we won't discuss things that are 
tough, that we'll begin to be avoidant of those tougher conversations. But it begs for us to have those discussions in our homes, in our social networks, in a way that can benefit that next generation. You and I were talking earlier about each generation that looks at the generation behind them will oftentimes say that generation's a mess. But we won't take ownership as the elder generation on what it is and how they got to be. They didn't just out of nowhere become who they are as a generation. So we've got to take some ownership into that space um, and figure out ways in which we can maneuver that is beneficial holistically, collectivistically. Um, realizing, Don, in this society, we are rooted in individualism, right? It's part of the, the fabric of our society. Um, and when things like a pandemic occur, that individualistic nature doesn't benefit us, that we need each other in a way um, that survival will, will move us forward. And I don't think we do a great job of discussing that, understanding that, and I think the bias inside us is playing in that space. I have a tough question for you now. Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> if a person is identified, if they take an IDI or they mm -hmm. uh, some other kind of test, yeah. racial healing, whatever uh, cognitive work they're doing, and they realize they themselves have uh, an implicit bias, a negative implicit bias. Mm -hmm. If it is someone else's fault that they are that way, whether it's their brain, that's somebody else, and if it's their parents, that's somebody else's fault, mm -hmm. they can avoid responsibility mm -hmm. by saying it's not my fault. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And do you see that? I see it happening all the time where they, uh, let me just use kind of common language. I'm not responsible for slavery. Mm -hmm. I didn't invent slavery. Yeah. So why should I, yeah. why should I, yeah. white person? Yeah, I think it's, it's, I think the age old idea of the buck stops somewhere and that we all have to take some level of ownership that even though your parents didn't own slaves, you benefited your parents benefited, and their parents benefited by that process. So that doesn't mean you owned slaves or you were responsible for it in any way, but there is a benefit process that would unfold. So owning that fact is critically important. Don, one of the things I think that we struggle with in this country, especially around the idea of race, is we have yet to have in this country a conversation that is rooted in truth and reconciliation. We haven't done it. Um, we have swept it under the rug. We've I've tried to avoid it. It won't go away. That before I can move to reconcile anything, there must be truth told. So for instance, if there's a couple, I'm a, I'm a marriage and family therapist, or I'm working with a couple, and there's infidelity. The partner that cheated is very quick to move towards reconciliation. Let's reconcile this. We're good, right? Let's go. But the partner that was cheated on will say, I need truth to be told. So that time that you told me you were going on that business trip, were you doing something that you weren't supposed to? Right? And you can see how tough that would be. You don't want to have that. Who wants to have that conversation? I just want to reconcile and move on. It's akin to what you just asked. Right? So there must be responsibility, even though I might not have done this, that, or the other, the buck must stop somewhere, and this must be a collective approach. We must come together, uh, and maybe I use the term must loosely, because we don't have to, um, but we can kind of see where that will end up. Um, but if we look at uh, Nazi Germany, and we, if we look at um, South Africa and apartheid, you go to Germany, they're gonna talk about the ills of the Holocaust. They're gonna talk about it, right? And own the fact that it was a nasty space. If you go to South Africa, they're gonna talk about the ills of apartheid. So they're gonna tell that truth about a very tough conversation. And then they move to reconcile. We haven't done that. 
we're missing that boat. And there's work to be done, um, and we have to collectively endeavor upon that work. I don't know if I answered your question. You did. That. <laughs> um, and, and so well that uh, my next question uh, was answered by you. So uh, <laughs> We're doing something right here, Don. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so why the avoidance behavior? Why do we avoid mm. this? Why do, uh, and, and let me be clear, why do white people avoid this subject? Yeah. What is it that is, uh, is it a fear of some loss of control? Is it, mm. the, is it sh shame? Is it guilt? Mm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is it fragility? Yeah, yeah. I think it's all of the above. Um, let's be clear that the idea of guilt is fully self-imposed, right? So if we talk, if we begin to have a discussion here about white guilt, I'll have to leave the stage and let y'all have it that look like you. <laughs> That's not my space. That's not, I, I'm, I'm not going to, I can't have that conversation. I won't have that conversation around white guilt or white fragility. That is left for you all. And I think it's an important conversation. Um, but let's realize and recognize where that ownership lies. But to your question, who wants to admit to that, Don? That's a tough space. No one wants to really discuss or talk about that. It doesn't feel good. It feels negative. So if we can just avoid it, be passive aggressive about it, hopefully it'll just all go away. We know that's not gonna be the case, but if I can just avoid it, I feel, I soothe myself. It's almost a self-soothing process to be avoidant of it. Um, and if I can donate a few hundred bucks to a process that may be helping a group other than I, I'll feel better, I'll mm -hmm. soothe myself. United but, Negro College. Yes, yes, but how did, does that attack the issue? No. No, but it makes me fit, it soothes me, right? So are we going to play into the space of really attacking, addressing, and engaging the struggle? Or are we going to play around? I submit to you that the bias inside us is saying, no, we're going to address this. We're going to talk about this in a really meaningful way that when you go through that exhibit, you walk out, with a lens of consciousness. And I submit to you that once you receive any level of awareness or consciousness, good, bad, or indifferent, you never get to turn it off. Once you become aware of something, it's with you as much as you'd like to avoid it because the idea, the statement of ignorance being blissful is so important. It's something we throw around. But if I can be ignorant to something, I can just giggle and move through life. But if I find or, or develop a level of awareness or consciousness around an idea that could be tough, I have to work on that. I have to deal with that every day. It's not going anywhere. I can try to suppress it, but it still presents itself in all kinds of situations. So that's the work in front of us. It's not easy, but I think it's the work. So I hesitate to ask you uh, for advice because <laughs> um, <laughs> It's clear, not only from you, from uh, all the reading that I've done and, and uh, private conversations, that racism is not my problem, the, the, the brother would say. Mm -hmm. It's not my problem. It's your problem. Mm -hmm. You have to deal with that. But I've I would gone, say it's our problem, though. Okay, good. Yeah. But uh, I've gone to a number of seminars on uh, uh, anti-racism, mm -hmm. and they're always taught by African-Americans. And uh, I don't know if uh, they're following your example in this case. And I don't know if there are a lot of conversations currently going on. And I'll just give you an example. Uh, I've taken the IDI probably five different times. Mm -hmm. And I'm just, I'm always disappointed because I'm almost in the acceptance category. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I finally, <laughs> and, 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 I, and I can't find anything in why I would not be all the way in the blue. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, and so I, I ask the uh, counselors and readers, and they say, all your questions about white people are the ones that are getting you in trouble, mm -hmm. not about the other. Mm -hmm. You don't accept uh, that uh, 
white people uh, and your whiteness. You don't accept that because, and, then, and I try to explain, well, because I know history. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm not really pleased. So when it asks me if I'm comfortable being white, mm -hmm. I answer no, yeah. because I don't like that. I don't like what we've done. Yeah. And uh, so I don't know if I'll ever get to the part of acceptance because acceptance requires that you accept yourself. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I see. So one thing that I talk a lot about, um, especially in the last few years, is simply understanding that history is always written by the winners. If you win, you write the history. If you lose, you have to pick up the book that was written by those that defeated you. Um, so I think understanding that is, is critically important. Um, and I, I think this concept and idea of acceptance, I think oftentimes uh, many of those things are very relative, Don. Right? It's relative. Um, and the way in which that was developed, those IDIs and all those things, I think there's tons of research that can fall one way or the other. But is the mission to be in the blue from some test? Or is the mission to go to work every day in my social network and impact it? Right, that's in my mind, that's the true question. I don't give a crap what color the blue or what, or what the acceptance <laughs> is. What are you doing with your social network to engage and move the, the needle in a way that you can go to bed at night saying, I'm doing something to impact this. I take an IDI or not, I want to impact my, the, the, and, and I think one of the things to that point is that I think we, we attack the big picture and don't feel like we get anything done. The picture, it's so broad, it's so big, and I end my day saying, I don't know if I did anything. But if I have a small network that I'm close with, that are friends and family and people that I see consistently, let's work to impact those networks. Because if you impact your network, Don, and I impact mine, and everyone in here impacts theirs, we've now moved the needle. So shouldn't that be the mission as opposed to where we're on a scale or all those things? I think those are important. I'm not diminishing that. But I think more important is the work every single day with my network. And once again, to ad nauseum, the, the work that the bias insidus is doing is saying, I'm going to move into this community, and let's impact this community for this period of time. Let's make this community more aware. That, right? So when we uproot and move on, we've done something with that community. It's more conscious. It's more aware. Now, what we know is just because you become aware doesn't mean you're going to make different choices that are beautiful. Um, I submit to you that the, the cousin of implicit bias is cognitive dissonance, right? Because now cognitive dissonance means I'm conscious of something and I'm now battling with myself. I'm battling every day. Now I'm conscious of it. It's no longer implicit. I'm conscious of it. I'm fighting with myself about this issue. New information has now been presented to me. And I can still make bad choices, but I'm aware of them now, right? So that move from implicit to that cognitive dissonance, um, and Fanon wrote about it uh, in a beautiful way, I think is the, partly the mission um, that we should hold when we're talking about things like bias. Is there a, a problem that may arise when a, a person becomes fully aware, a white person becomes fully aware of their biases and does the work that you're suggesting uh, that uh, A, they uh, might uh, let themselves off the hook by uh, appearing uh, to be anti-racist mm -hmm. um, and, and maybe they're holding on to an element of the uh, individual personal system, mm -hmm. as well as the uh, systems we see all around us, which were constructed by white people for white people, mm -hmm. which dynamically 
uh, are, was designed to hold the other down mm -hmm. and keep their superiority. Uh, is there a, uh, a problem in actually achieving what uh, bias and situs is trying to get to? That is uh, a reckoning. So using your example of the truth and reconciliation, mm -hmm. Before reconciliation, as you pointed out in your analogy, the truth has to come first. Mm -hmm. You have to tell the truth yes. to yourself and to others. Yes. And that's why I bring up the historical references. And once you know the truth, yeah. that you have been supporting these systems yeah. that discriminate and harm and keep down, yeah. uh, that Truth can be so painful as to stick in your throat and you can't utter it. Let's say something about pain, because I think you're right. Um, but let us reframe pain, not for only the sake of pain, but let's reframe pain as a indicator of growth. Hmm. Yeah, so let, pain is, not, if it's just for the sake of pain, I'm going to lean away from it. I don't want that. But if I feel pain, discomfort, and have reframed that as an indicator that I'm growing, I'll stick with it. Or my propensity, I'm more prone to stick with that. Um, so engaging with this discomfort in a way that in an iterative process will help me move through something that doesn't feel good, but on the other side is something that I know I need. Um, I'm more prone to stick with that. Um, and I don't think, I think all too often, people don't see it that way. And when they feel this discomfort, they want to quickly avoid it, get away, move away, shift it. So if we're talking about race, what I've found, especially with my white peers, when we talk about race, if you talk long enough, all of a sudden we're talking about socioeconomic status and we're talking about gender. And now we've shifted into a, why? Because that was uncomfortable. Man, I don't want to be uncomfortable, so we'll shift. Um, I, my submission is we have to stay with that discomfort because let's be clear, Don, at 6'3", 3'10", and if I have a good meal, it's 3'15", <laughs> I'm not comfortable every day as I walk through this world. That when I walk through this world wearing earrings and the clothes that I may choose to wear and a sweatsuit, you don't see a doc. You don't see Dr. Yeager. You see somebody that maybe bird, an OG, uh, right? That's what you're going to see first. You're not going to see a University of Minnesota PhD. It's not what you're going to see. Um, so I'm used to the level of discomfort that being black deeply brown in this country um, carries with it. I ask and challenge my white peers to, st to stick with their discomfort um, and understand that that may move you in a way that being comfortable can never do. All right, so let's be uncomfortable together because I've been there and I ain't, it ain't going nowhere for me. Yeah. Um, so I ask others to join us in this, in this discomfort and the, and the mission of change and moving in a direction is important. As a family therapist, one of the things that we talk about uh, and the research talks about is differentiating between types of change. There's what we call first order and second order change. Um, the metaphor that I use is you walk into a home, first order change is saying, Take all the pictures off the wall, get all the carpet out of here, um, put new paintings up, change the color. But the structure is the same, but I changed. I submit that we need second order change. Knock the walls down and forever change the structure. Even if you put a new wall up in that space, it won't be the same wall. So I submit that we need to endeavor upon a level of second order change that will be very uncomfortable but it calls for it in, in this country, um, and it has called for it for many, many years. Um, will we get there? Uh, 
in my lifetime? I, I don't know. Maybe my sons will see it. The browning of America. Many of the kid, the, the country will begin to look like my sons in 40, 30, 40, 50 years. And maybe that's the change. Um, I don't know. When people go through the bias and science exhibit all over the country, um, I, I don't know that we know how many individuals of the thousands who will go through the exhibit uh, will actually uh, change in, uh, in a particular way. Yeah. Uh, they may come away with, uh, and I'll talk about uh, white people and, and anyone in power. Mm -hmm. uh, they may say, uh, they may say, I feel guilty. But it may also, what they may be feeling is shame. Clinically, mm -hmm. tell me the difference between guilt and shame. Because I've always believed, and in consultation with uh, your uh, colleague, Delta, <laughs> uh, she, uh, my daughter, uh, has... She's a hell of a therapist, I get that. <laughs> she is a hell of a therapist. And also an LMFT. So, yes. um, uh, guilt is, is paralyzing, is, uh, causes people to ossify. Shame can be a motivating thing. Because you want to get out from under that shame. Mm. Guilt, the only way to get out to under guilt is to apologize. Mm. <laughs> That's the only way you get out from under yeah. guilt. Take yeah. responsibility. Yeah. And I think uh, people who are guilty are not going to apologize because yeah. that's too painful. It's too much. Um, but shame says, I, I've got to I've change things. I've got to do better. Yeah, yeah. And so clinically, is there a difference between... Uh, the response of a person who goes through uh, bias and situs who feel on one side guilt, one side shame. Yeah, Don, I would say I haven't really, that's a great question. I haven't, I haven't really wrapped my mind around that thinking. I love that, that idea, um, differentiating in between the two. I, I think that one of the struggles that we have is not necessarily the level of shame, especially in the white community, but more the level of shamelessness, mm. right? Mm. The, right? Mm. the level of shamelessness mm. that is held when we discuss these issues like bias and race. There's almost a shamelessness that occurs um, that I'm just gonna stand my ground and I'm gonna say, well, I didn't have anything to do with that stuff and you guys need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps um, I would say that oftentimes in the black and brown community, we hear the idea of pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps. Hell, we ain't even got boots, mm. much less straps. Um, so I like this, this idea of differentiating shame, guilt. Haven't really played with that much. And see, you're already, I'll be at home tonight researching <laughs> shame and guilt and the, the differentiation. Um, that's, an, that's an interesting point. Um, I do know, and I think I said a bit earlier, that this idea of guilt is self-imposed. You put that on yourself. Um, so trying to figure out what's the root of why I would impose that guilt. Um, I feel bad. I feel guilty about something that has happened. I'm going to put that on myself. I don't know how helpful that is. I, maybe it is. Um, but... That's, I mean, it's a, it's, a great, it's a great frame. I'll be up at 2 a.m. looking at guilt and shame. Uh, just to continue on this and, and as a way of an explanation, the, um, the idea of uh, guilt it will always be held a secret. Mm -hmm. you, will never, yes. you will never admit. That's right. uh, in a court of law, you will never admit. Yep. You'll protect that. And that's why I'm, when, once you're guilty, yeah. of something, it's going to be really, really difficult hard. to come out of, yeah. uh, no matter what color you are. Yeah. Uh, and shame is not that, is that you failed yourself. Mm. You're shameful because you have a high standard you set and you failed that. So then I would say, the question that, that begs on that is, so what is the standard in terms of bias and race for the white community? I don't know what that is. What's the, what is the standard? Uh, that's a scary 
thing to really even consider because the standard is pretty damn low probably. I'm just guessing. Um, so how do we play with that standard? There may be something there to play with too, Don. What is that standard? Where do we get it? Where did the white community get it and establish it? And how do we move it? Right? And I said we. I didn't say no. y'all move it. Yeah. How do we collectively endeavor upon that movement? Um, and, I, and again, I would guess that movement's going to be painful and very uncomfortable. And I, I, most people don't, don't want to lean into that, Don. You want to lean away from it. Yeah. Right? Are we talking about the remaking of America? Are we talking about, I'm going to give you an example, practical example. I'm on the news, I'm doing the news, and uh, Ronald Reagan imposes the war on drugs, and it is colored this way. Because the crack epidemic is, is uh, decimating the black community. So we're going to crack down on, and that was bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, it was designed from its jump. Uh, to just put more black people in jail. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But the way it was sold to me seemed a reasonable thing. Yeah. Makes until sense. I realized and I was told and I discovered and I investigated yeah. that no, this was actually what was happening. Yeah. So the systems we support, yeah. uh, how do we investigate systems and policies? with an eye toward the existence of bias and an eye toward the reconciliation and the elimination of systems or the rejuvenation of systems uh, in order to create a more equitable, understanding, loving uh, yeah. nation. Yeah, I think one of the struggles in, in your submission is that we jump to this big, broad, heavy lifting idea, idea before we first say, all right, let's define some of these things and let's make sure that we're talking about the same thing, right? I think too often we, we want to fix something, we'll throw billions of dollars at something and we have yet to even define the issue together. Um, so I think it calls for um, and I don't, I don't have a lot of faith um, in our leaders in this country. I don't care if it's the elephant or the donkey, I, it doesn't matter to me. There's, the, the system is broken, um, so there, the system as it currently exists is not going to fix anything. It's broken. So before we say, let's together try to figure out how to fix this, the system that would even be able to begin to fix it, it is broken. So how do we re-engage um, just at a civic level, the discourse of leaders in this country is sickening. So I think there's so, so much work to be done before we can even move to the space that you just described. And I think that's, we missed the boat on that a lot, Don, that we wanna jump to those bigger issues and we don't even agree on the small pieces yeah. that we must fundamentally and foundationally have in place to even address those bigger issues. So I think it begs for that civic discourse. And I, again, I'm going to say it, Don, that means that we have to do the work in those small networks first. Mm -hmm. We have to. You don't fix the whole system and, without first addressing the subsystems and the coalitions that are built within all of those systems and subsystems, we've got to do that small work first, and then, and only then, can we begin to address those bigger issues. Corey, thank you very much. I uh, wanna make sure that we uh, find anybody in the audience who might have questions for Dr. Yeager. Uh, we have this uh, box here, and if you just want to hold up your hand, if you have a question you'd like to address to Dr. Yeager, right up there. Right. Are you ready? I'm going to throw it to you. <laughs> Catch the box, open it up, there's that. a microphone inside it. Hello, hello. Dr. Yeager, um, I work in diversity, equity, and inclusion work myself, and 
have a lot of struggle with educating people around the concept of implicit bias because white folks like to eat all the air in the room as soon as they start having feelings about it. Yeah. Whether it's not real, whether it's so real and oh my God, how am I gonna unbury myself? But ultimately, I find that that in most cases fails to lead to action on behalf of the people who are actually harmed. Mm -hmm. So how can we educate people without it paralyzing them in their own guilt and their feelings yeah. so that they actually help people? Yeah, I think one of the things we have to do, <clears throat> especially in those, those spaces, those are those social networks that I was talking about. Work is a social network. Is laying good, firm, foundational understanding as before we get into the conversation. So this is what we're about to talk about. Let's lay some good, firm under, ground rules before we endeavor into it. Um, this is not a space in this conversation to really move into white guilt and white fragility. So even saying that from the outset, um, there, there may be spaces for that that can be held. This is not what this is set up to do. So you, kinda, you can kind of, it's almost a preemptive strike <clears throat> that before it can even go there, because you know that that may be the case, is you lay that out. And then you also ask people for the permission to challenge them. Now let me check, can I, and I've done, I ask people all the time. I don't necessarily ask my wife off very much. <laughs> I just challenge. I don't ask for permission. I kind of just do it. Um, <clears throat> but if we can preemptively lay that out, that means then when you start to move it into a different space, I can say, hey, I'm going to challenge you on that. Right? Where are you all right with that? That's not what, remember we talked about from the beginning. That's not what we're going to do in this meeting. Maybe there's a different one that will do that, yeah. but not for this. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yep. Show of hands. Question for Dr. Yeager. Headed up that way. Ready? Um, yeah, I know. That's a, that was not my skill set. Um, thank you. This was fantastic. Thank you so much. You, um, Doctor, you keep mentioning white fragility. And, um, you know, Robin D'Angelo wrote the book, and it was eye-opening for many people, right? And it was controversial, right? Hmm. Um, have you ever had, and this, and this is, could be a yes or no question, and then what your thoughts are, have you ever had a, a conversation with Robin on her book? No, no, I haven't spoken to Robin on her book, <clears throat> but the one thing that I would say, and I've, I've talked about this in a number of spaces, People ask me if I read the book. I said, no, I haven't read it, it's not for me, mm -hmm. right? I, so there's, I got a lot of things to read, right. um, but I haven't read that, and I, don't, I probably won't read it. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't had a conversation with her. Um, I think it's an important piece of work. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Even if you don't agree, it allows for the discourse. I think that's critically important. Um, allowing the discourse to take seed from that discourse, there'll be information, new finding, new understanding that will help us move this agenda. Um, so I think it's an important piece. Uh, I haven't really played with it, um, but I hope others will and do. And it, it is interesting that you say that. We, um, I was with Literacy Matters Foundation. I'm with Thomson Reuters now, but I was the executive director for Literacy Matters Foundation. And we had a conversation, it was during uh, COVID, and we were having um, a wonderful conversation about uh, unconscious bias. And so we invited Robin mm -hmm. to uh, say a few things before we actually had our conversation, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it was quite interesting her what she had to say about it because she, you know, she has the book, but to, to hear what she says about it as well mm -hmm. and the comments. So I just thought it was. An, really interesting to hear from her viewpoint. Mm -hmm. She wrote this book, and then the kind of comments that she was receiving from it, yeah. negative and positive, yeah. right? But that's where growth happens, right? Exactly. I love that. Because you get to grow in that space, yes. agree or not. Um, and I think that's one thing that I would, I would say as well. I think too often that we, we seek agreement, where, but what we miss is the step of first seeking understanding. I don't have to agree with you but I need to be able to understand why you see the world the way you do. 
right? And I can totally disagree with you, but at least I can say, I understand how you got to that. Right. I don't agree with it, but I understand. I think we miss that, that space. We seek, we seek agreement. I want you to agree with me. I want to argue. Right. No, you can agree or disagree. It doesn't really matter. To me, I want you to understand my position, and then you do with it what you may. And you have the discussion. Yes. I love that. That's the important part. That's, I love that. Yeah. Thank you so much. This is mm -hmm. wonderful. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Steve Lear has a question down here. Aaliyah. <laughs> and you can catch it better. Another one? OK. Thank you for coming here. I've really enjoyed the conversation. Um, one of the questions I have for you is, have you thought about differentiating between personal bias and group bias? It's very easy for me to forgive or even accept guilt at an individual level. I can look at a person of color, I'm one, and say, I, I, I'm sorry if I've ever mistreated you. At the group level, it's a whole different thing. So when you think of what must we do as a country that is completely different than, or it feels to me very different, than what we must do as individuals. Yeah. Because as individuals, we can take ownership. As a country, now we're talking about institutionalizing policies and ideas and rules and so on and so forth that I don't think we'll ever agree on. So I'd like to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, I just, I, I do believe that that individualistic space, and it's what my book focused on. Uh, I wrote a book, and the name of the book is How Am I Doing? Um, and it's really about re-engaging with self to better understand why you see the world in the way in which you do. Um, because if, if you really think about it, at the age 10, 12, 13, you've been handed a set of values from your family. And now you go out into the world with this value system that you didn't create but was given to you. And then you look around and you're 53 and you're still moving with that same value system, but you've never taken the time to really check back in to say, so does this fit for me? And where did I get it from? And how did I develop it? And where am I headed? So I think that this individualistic space, looking in the mirror of your life to better understand um, why you see it that way, how you see it that way, um, can trickle into a broader group dynamic. But I think you're right, and it's kind of what I was saying earlier, you, you open, and broaden, open it to such a broad scope, it's hard to impact because you have so many individual views within that group dynamic. Um, and it can be frustrating, and that's when I think people quit. They just stop, because I can't impact this broad society or this big group, so I'm not going to do it. Um, I think we've got to stick with it. It's not going to feel good, but we've got to stick with it individual level that hopefully will seed into something broader. Thank you both for everything that you've done for the bias inside us. So the question, there's so much intellectual capacity up on this stage. <laughs> that I'd like to ask both of you. You're talking about him, then. Oh. <laughs> I'd like to ask both of you this question. We're 10 years in the future. What's an optimistic vision and what's a pessimistic vision that the two of you have related to this bias inside us? I'm going to be short with this and give it to Don. I wrote a piece three years ago, <clears throat> the name of the piece was A Cold Civil War. Um, I think since then, it's heated up. So I think that we're, we're kind of, this country is fractured, um, and we're playing around with a version of a civil war right now. Pessimistically, 10 years from now, that fracture broadens itself. We endeavor upon a second civil war, pessimistically. Optimistically, we get back to things that, uh, I mean, especially in terms of leadership in this country, we can get back to the way in which we engage civically 20, 30, 40 years ago, that they, I didn't have to hate you um, to disagree. We could talk about things that, re that we both represent our constituents, and we can move an agenda 
and I don't have to hate you because you don't agree with me. So I think optimistically is getting back to those days so we can move forward. So that would be my optimistic, pessimistic stance. Uh, for me, I'm uh, always in my mind uh, MLK's words about uh, the idea that uh, gradualism will not work. Mm. And uh, it feels like there is movement. There is movement toward a kind of reconciliation, but it's just snail slow. Mm. And it's not organized in the sense that uh, uh, white supremacy abounds. It just abounds. And how you wrestle down the idea of white supremacy. Um, the, one of the ways it can be done is by this self-recognition that the bias inside us exhibit provides, where people walk in and go, mm. oh, I'm confronted with yeah. this truth about me That's right. because I'm failing all these tests. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and with the, the, the advent of these tests like IDEIs and things like that, people are coming to the conclusion that there is something wrong. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you're confronted with the idea that there is something wrong, there are uh, enough good people in the world who say, well, if there's something wrong, we've got to fix that. Mm -hmm. So it's like a car, we will yeah. fix that. That's right. So I'm, the positive part is I think that there is a slow, too slow for me, but positive movement toward something that has never been tackled before. We have not changed our systems before, but there are now bills in legislatures all over the place. There are companies rewriting complete policies. There are universities uh, changing their, uh, the testing requirements, mm. schools at the high school and the, and the grade school level. There is really positive movement, not like the movement of the 60s, where there was an under, uh, understanding being developed and an awareness being developed, but actual changes being developed. And I, uh, the, there were three that stick out, the 54 Board of Education Brown and uh, the Civil Rights Act and Voting Rights Act. But that was so long ago. Mm -hmm. The fundamental systemic changes have not been tackled, but will be tackled. That's my positive view. I think this, we are in the middle of something very, very profound. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the other side is that uh, human beings come to the end of their rope and have uh, and no one as an ally helping them, and uh, they will um, find a way to depart the society, mm -hmm. and I will not live under this regime any longer. Mm -hmm. And then you have complete racial separation. Mm -hmm. That's the worst. <clears throat> There's a young person right here as well. He, were you wanting to ask a question? There's a person okay. right there to your left. Okay, this is gonna be the last one. I'm, uh, I'm afraid we're, we're just, uh, there's so much to talk about. What, what's this young man doing? Yep, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm on it. Uh, so before I hand the mic over though, I just uh, wanna say that bef as we wrap up, some of you who haven't had a chance to see the Bias Inside Us exhibit uh, will be able to view it until nine o'clock up on the fourth floor. Um, and with that, I will hand it over to our last question. I go to school with a lot of white kids who have very negative biases on race. And me as a kid wanting to change that, I would try to have some advice on that. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> he said, I would try to have some advice on that. Yeah. That's the best question of the night, bud. Um, so <clears throat> one thing that I would say is, when you hear some of those negative things, instead of telling people, hey, don't, you shouldn't say that, don't say that, find a way to be curious with them.
Because if people, t if someone tells you, yeah, you shouldn't do that, don't do that, you don't want to hear that. But if you hear someone say, why, I wonder why you would say that. I'm trying to figure it out. I, like my upbringing, I wouldn't say that. But I'm trying to, I wonder why would you say that? Mm -hmm. So that curiosity, what happens is, if I'm curious with you, now I'm pushing you to answer why you've said something or done something. And now what can that do? That can turn into a conversation. And that person then walks away saying, I didn't think about that. They may not tell you, but now you've impacted them in a way that they're thinking about it. And that could change how they see it or how they move. So I, my, my piece of advice would be, don't try to tell people not to do it. Don't tell your peers, don't do that, don't say that. Just be curious with them, ask them why. Why'd you do that? Why do you say that? And just then be prepared to have that conversation. Um, and I think that's a better approach than just telling them not to do it. Does that make sense? And when you go back to school, just say, Dr. Corey Yeager taught me the Socratic <laughs> method. <laughs> the Socratic method. That's right. Uh, that's right. Great question. Thank you very Great much. Great question, Bob. Thank you for that uh, question. I have, uh, in 55 years, I've interviewed uh, six presidents. I've uh, interviewed some of the uh, greatest known uh, names, all of whom would be recognizable to you, some of which I've done for PBS. Uh, but let me tell you from the bottom of my heart, this is the most important interview I've ever done in my life. Mm. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Corey Yeager.